Hello everybody, we're going to talk here about preceptal and orbital cellulitis, which are some skin and soft tissue uh, conditions that are uh, of importance in ophthalmology. Uh, this is going to be a of particular importance to you if you work with the pediatric population, both in pediatrics and in emergency medicine, but it does happen in adults as well. Uh, this is something that's very commonly tested on the USMLE and for good purpose because these uh, are common conditions and orbital cellulitis in particular is an emergent condition. So uh, these are, are pretty important to understand. So there's just two that we're going to talk about, preceptal and orbital cellulitis. You need to understand the difference between the two. Uh, and uh, this is some anatomy here. Uh, don't worry about all of these little details. What I want to point out is this very pertinent structure. Uh, it's going to be pertinent in what we're talking about for our purposes. And this is the orbital septum here. And the orbital septum is just a thin fibrous tissue that extends from the orbital periosteum uh, down to the anterior portion of the tarsus and the eyelid. And it's this orbital septum that actually will confine uh, a uh, preceptal cellulitis uh, from extending into the orbital cavity. And so that's why preceptal cellulitis is not quite as severe as orbital cellulitis, which surrounds the eye and all those important structures. So it is this structure here, this orbital septum, that's of importance for keeping preceptal cellulitis where it is and not extending in, uh, further into the uh, orbital cavity. So here's the sinuses. This is going to be important because sinusitis, infections in the sinus, especially the ethmoid sinuses here in green, uh, have a tendency to extend and cause orbital cellulitis. So these sinuses, they're important to know where they're at uh, so that you can percuss them because if there is tenderness in these sinuses, it will indicate that there is likely sinusitis and sinusitis is very highly correlated both with preceptal and orbital cellulitis, especially orbital cellulitis. So we'll start with preceptal cellulitis. This is a common infection of soft tissues anterior to the orbital septum. It's confined by the orbital septum, and it includes all that skin around the eye, so eyelids and surrounding soft tissue, and it's marked by what we would expect in cellulitis with a bacterial infection, uh, and that is edema and erythema, as well as warmth if you were to feel it. Remember your cardinal signs of inflammation, ruber, calor, dolor, etc. So this is a bacterial infection, primarily uh, staph and strep, as well as haemophilus influenza type B. And we don't see preceptal cellulitis as much as we used to 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And the reason is because of the uh, HIV in, uh, vaccine. So we, uh, we immunize babies now. Uh, with the HIV vaccine, and that prevents them from getting haemophilus influenza type B infections, and uh, that has since reduced the cases of preceptal cellulitis. Usually, precept preceptal cellulitis will antecede a upper respiratory tract infection, particularly sinusitis. Can also uh, come after a uh, any uh, any eye infection like dacryocystitis or blepharitis or conjunctivitis, and spread from there to the preceptal tissue. Primarily, this is a disease of pediatrics. 80% uh, of preceptal cellulitis cases are in patients under the age of 10, and the majority of cases are in children under the age of 5. Um, I should add that there are a couple other things that can cause uh, preceptal cellulitis in addition to these common culprits, staph strep and HIV. Uh, it can also be caused by smallpox. Smallpox has been eradicated in the U.S., so it's not really a concern. Um, and it can also be caused by anthrax, but uh, the only reason I add that is because uh, you know, with this, in the age of biological terrorism, anthrax uh, is out there, and um, it's worth knowing that as a pearl of, uh, of wisdom. So, uh, 
Uh, some risk factors, of course, the upper respiratory tract infection and sinusitis tend to precede preceptal cellulitis. Um, a concurrent varicella infection uh, has been uh, demonstrated to increase the risk of preceptal cellulitis. And then patients who have asthma, nasal polyps, usually nasal polyps are, uh, are associated with asthma anyway, that's also associated with preceptal cellulitis or an increased risk of preceptal cellulitis. And then an immunocompromised state, and that can include things like neutropenia, any kind of uh, inherited immunocompromised disease, and diabetes mellitus. So how do these patients present? Typically they come in with uh, redness around the eyelids and uh, the surrounding tissue. I'll show you a picture of that. That may prevent or make it more difficult to open the eyelids. It won't be quite as severe as with the orbital cellulitis, but you can. Uh, there, there may be difficulty opening the eyelids, and that can cause problems getting in to look at the rest of the eye. Uh, if you do get in to look at the rest of the eye, which you should, uh, you'll probably you should see conjunctival injection or con just flat out conjunctivitis with pus. Uh, there's probably going to be tearing. The patient may describe some mild blurring, but vision should not be significantly affected. With preceptal cellulitis, vision is not as affected as with the orbital cellulitis. So here's uh, a typical case of preceptal cellulitis, relatively mild. Uh, this patient doesn't have any problems keeping his eye open, it appears, but there is that redness are on the eyelids and the surrounding tissue. So here's a little bit more severe. You can see that the eye is a little bit more swollen shut. And if you uh, open the eye here, you can see that there can be a significant injection of the conjunctiva. This, I wasn't sure, uh, I tried to look into what this picture was actually pointing to. It looks like uh, this is a dacryocystitis, and that would make sense because preceptal cellulitis can antecede dacryocystitis. You have an infection of the nasal lacrimal duct, it can spread into the surrounding tissue. As far as physical exam, it's going to be really important, and I wanted to point out here that you need to do a good ocular exam because... If you diagnose preceptal cellulitis, you need to be absolutely certain that the patient doesn't have orbital cellulitis because if you don't properly diagnose orbital cellulitis, which is an emergency, uh, then you won't properly treat the patient and the uh, consequences of uh, improperly treated orbital cellulitis or insufficiently treated orbital cellulitis can be deadly, uh, can be uh, deadly to the patient, deadly to the eye, uh, and uh, so you really need to be able to differentiate preceptal from orbital cellulitis. So things you can do, of course, inspect the outer eye, especially the lids and the surrounding skin. Kind of already did that by looking at those, uh, looking at those pictures. You know what that looks like. You should also percuss the sinuses for tenderness, uh, because a uh, painful sinuses is a uh, sign of sinusitis, and that's associated with preceptal cellulitis. You should also document the range of motion of the eyes. Typically, patients with preceptal cellulitis should be able to move their eyes in all directions, and you should note any pain. Uh, you should also document the pupillary response. In preceptal cellulitis, we expect a normal pupillary response and document any visual impairment. Like I said, with preceptal cellulitis, there may be mild visual impairments and blurriness, but it's not uh, anything real significant or severe. And then also perform a fundal examination, uh, particularly looking at that optic disc. For diagnosis, it's primarily clinical. Preceptal cellulitis has a very, uh, has a very uh, to characteristic presentation. The most important thing, though, is to rule out orbital cellulitis. If you're not sure, you can get an orbital CT, especially if there's factors suggesting orbital cellulitis, if there's an abnormal pupillary response, if the patient doesn't have normal range of motion of the eyes, if there's severe visual impairment, if there's papilledema, uh, then you can go ahead and get an orbital CT. 
uh, but that's not necessary for the diagnosis of preceptal cellulitis. It's a clinical diagnosis. As far as culturing in labs, uh, you only need to get blood cultures if the patient shows signs of sepsis, if they have fever, uh, reduced blood pressure. Typically, that does, that's not present. Just fever, you don't need to uh, get blood cultures. But if the patient shows signs of sepsis, you, you can get blood cultures. But you should do that before instituting antibiotics. Uh, if there is any purulent material, though, that you see uh, from the, coming from the eyes, then uh, you should culture that because that will uh, likely show what the pathogen is. As far as management, we're going to start these patients once we've confirmed preceptal cellulitis and uh, more so ruled out orbital cellulitis. Uh, once we're set on the diagnosis of preceptal cellulitis, uh, we'll start broad spectrum antibiotics. Typically, uh, these are uh, particularly directed towards upper respiratory tract infection organisms, uh, so Staph aureus, uh, HIV, Staph epidermidis, Strep anaerobes. Uh, so an example could be amoxicillin clavulanate. I like to shy away from using amoxicillin clavulanate, as you've probably heard me say several times if you've watched my lectures, because this drug gives patients really bad diarrhea and abdominal pain. Uh, I would prefer using a second or third generation cephalosporin. Uh, you can use something like uh, ceftriaxone, um, there's lots of different drugs that can be used, though, um, but make sure that you're using broad-spectrum antibiotics. You should also get an ophthalmology consult for all pediatric patients, and like I said, that makes up the majority of preceptal cellulitis patients. Um, you can also get an ophthalmology consult for adult patients if you can't rule out orbital cellulitis based on your findings. If this is a neonate, you should get a lumbar puncture in all cases. Uh, because we're concerned about possible uh, meningitis, you should definitely get, uh, if there's any signs of meningismus in any patient, you should always get a lumbar puncture. Preceptal cellulitis does have, as a complication, meningitis. So uh, we need to be aware of that. So lumbar puncture for neonates, because they can't tell you if they have meningismus, and patients who do have signs of meningitis, possible meningitis, you should get a lumbar puncture. And then if there's any abscesses, usually these will be on the eyelid or uh, on the nasolacrimal duct, uh, then uh, you should drain that. And usually that will be done uh, by an ophthalmologist. As far as admitting the patient, it does, you don't always have to admit the patient. Typically they are admitted for at least 24 hours, but this is at the deferral of the primary provider and the consulting ophthalmologist. Okay, so orbital cellulitis. So this this big bad orbital cellulitis we've been talking about until now. This is a problem in an emergency, and if this is not diagnosed properly, it can be deadly. 11% of orbital cellulitis cases, even if they are treated, will result in vision loss uh, of, of that eye. So this is an infection of the adnexa and the soft tissues that surround the orbit posterior to the orbital septum. So if we go way back here, it's all this stuff back here, behind the orbital septum. The most common cause is direct extension, especially from those ethmoid sinuses, but it can also spread from dacryocystitis, from dental infections, or from phlebitis of surrounding veins, particularly the facial vein. Other causes include uh, incidental or surgical trauma uh, and hematogenous spread. Typically, the cause of orbital cellulitis is similar to, uh, to the causes of preceptal cellulitis. Uh, so staph, strep, HIV, anaerobes, uh, MRSA, bacteroides. Uh, but there's also in, uh, in uh, immunocompromised patients, we also think about some of the fungal causes, uh, particularly uh, mucor. So uh, the symptoms, these patients tend to present pretty similar to preceptal cellulitis, but when you look at them, it might look a little bit more severe. Uh, but you can't tell just by looking at them. Uh, well, with one exception. I'll show you that. 
So typical history, just like uh, preceptal cellulitis, uh, recent upper respiratory tract infection is common, sinusitis. Uh, these patients can also come in with fever and malaise, and there's also redness and edema of the lids. So that looks just like preceptal cellulitis. What are the distinguishing factors? What makes this orbital cellulitis? Some things to look out for that say orbital cellulitis, some red flags include proptosis, so bulging of the eyes, uh, ophthalmoplegia, so they can't move their eyes in uh, directions, they have loss of range of motion of the orbit, and papal edema, so that's why you're looking at the back, looking at that optic disc for swelling. Those these signs, if you see any of these, you should definitely be getting a CT to look for orbital cellulitis. You would never send this patient off and say they have preceptal cellulitis if they have any of these distinguishing factors. Okay, so this is proptosis. So if a patient comes in and looks like this, you know the patient has orbital cellulitis. You know this is not preceptal cellulitis. Because what's causing this bulging? There has to be something behind the eye that's pushing the eye outward. If it's in front of the eye, in front of the orbital septum, you're not going to, the, the eye is not going to get pushed outward. If anything, it would be pushed backwards. So this is orbital cellulitis until proven otherwise. But most patients aren't this obvious. So a lot of times they look like this. You don't have, it's, it's the, the proptosis isn't that obvious. There's a lot of swelling of the eye, but if you were to palpate this patient's eye compared to the other one, you would probably be able to feel some proptosis, although I guarantee you this patient would get really mad at you if you try to really push on their eye, so you'd probably want to be gentle. Here's a, another pretty good case of proptosis uh, in conjunction with orbital cellulitis. This one's really bad. So this was actually, I read the case file for this one, this was actually caused from trauma. It was actually caused from dog bite. So in this case, you're directly uh, introducing uh, uh, bacteria into, into the orbital cavity. So notice that swelling of the, uh, of the outer tissues as well as uh, prominent proptosis, and that proptosis just tells you there's something going on around or behind the eye, and around or behind the eye is orbital cellulitis. In front of the eye is preceptal cellulitis, in front of the orbital septum. So for diagnosis, if orbital cellulitis is suspected, then the most important first step is a high-res orbital CT. And this is also the same thing that you're going to get if you're not sure if the patient has preceptal cellulitis or orbital cellulitis. Remember, I said get a CT if you don't know. Uh, but if, it's, if you think it's orbital cellulitis, you still need to get a, a high-resolution orbital CT. And that will confirm the diagnosis. In patients who have orbital cellulitis, because this is more severe, uh, you should get blood cultures and any cultures of purulent material. Once you've gotten the blood cultures, you can admit the patient. All of these patients are going to be admitted, and they're going to be in the hospital for at least a week. Uh, you'll be starting broad-spectrum antibiotics. After taking the blood culture, step three will make sure that you know that. You don't start antibiotics and then get blood cultures. You'll, uh, you, you won't taint the blood, but you'll, you'll taint your culture. Uh, so some examples of broad-spectrum antibiotics here include uh, Piptaz, Piperacillin, Tazobactam, Cefuroxime. Um, you could also use Nafcillin, uh, Ceftazidine uh, together. Uh, so there's lots of different choices. Uh, you should also, in endemic areas, and this is really, this depends on where you're at, uh, if, uh, if you're in a MRSA endemic area, you could add vancomycin to whatever broad-spectrum IV antibiotic uh, you're using. So you would just piggyback that on to your broad-spectrum IV antibiotic. Um, I would say if you're, you know, you're looking at step two, and they give you a list of choices, if vancomycin is added on as an option, 
Um, so it's, if it's a cefuroxime plus vancomycin, I would pick that over just cefuroxime alone because they're going to want you to know that MRSA is a possibility uh, as a cause for orbital cellulitis. Uh, but in reality, you're only going to use it in the endemic areas. If you're dealing with an immunocompromised patient uh, or in a patient who has concurrent uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, you should consider the addition of amphotericin B. Uh, I would recommend that if you have an immunocompromised patient or a patient with concurrent DKA, uh, that you're immediately consulting infectious disease because they're the ones that are going to be able to tell you what to do in these special cases. You should also get a lumbar puncture, as usual, in neonates or patients with meningismus, just like you would in preceptal cellulitis. And then, of course, you're going to want ophthalmology on board. You'll probably want infectious disease on board. And then depending on, uh, on what you see on the, uh, on the CT uh, or on the lumbar puncture, if you get one, you'll want ENT and neurosurgery on board as well. So... Lots, lots of white coats around these patients, and that's for good reason because this is a uh, this is a possibly uh, site threatening. It is a site threatening uh, disease, and it can also be fatal if it's not treated properly. Complications are vision loss, like I said, up to 11 percent. It can extend and become meningitis. Uh, you can also get cavernous sinus thrombosis. It can extend into actually into the brain, and you can also get subperiosteal abscesses. So, in summary, both preceptal and orbital cellulitis can present with fever, eyelid erythema and edema, pain, red eye, fever, and malaise. Okay, so you see that? Is it preceptal or orbital cellulitis? The next thing you want to ask is, are there these red flag signs of orbital cellulitis? So orbital cellulitis, unlike preceptal cellulitis, tends to have ophthalmoplegia, particularly a painful ophthalmoplegia where the patient can't move their eyes in the full range of motion. That prominent proptosis, or maybe not so prominent proptosis, but the eye is still bulging more than the other one, very decreased vision, uh, and papilledema. And that papilledema would be because there's swelling, infection, back around the optic nerve. Uh, and increasing the pressure. So if there's any of those red flag signs, you're going to get a CT, high resolution orbital CT, and from there you can make your diagnosis of orbital cellulitis. Uh, orbital cellulitis will require admission to the hospital. They're going to be on IV antibiotics for at least a week, and after you discharge them, they need to be on oral antibiotics for uh, at least two to three weeks. If you have any questions, go ahead and uh, comment below. See you next time.